Welcome everybody to tonight's celebration and conversation with the 2020 John B. Oaks Award winners. I'm Steve Paul and I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia. I'm sorry we can't be together in person tonight as we usually are, but I'm delighted that uh, we can gather this way to talk with this year's winners and uh, our two finalists. I'm going to uh, highlight their amazing environmental reporting and then introduce them and our moderator for tonight's program. Um, and uh, we'll be taking your questions later in the chat function uh, down there at the center bottom of your, of your screen. Uh, you know, while we're waiting for everybody to join and settle in, um, you know, I know we're all uh, aware of how the smoke and flames that have engulfed much of the West Coast over the last couple of weeks have uh, reminded us again how um, vital and of um, rising urgency environmental reporting is these days. I was trying to reflect on kind of where we are in this field and um, you know, I imagine many of you uh, share this in your professional lives and newsrooms, this sense that you know, a lot of us uh, started out when environmental reporting was a, was a beat. It was a, it was a subject for specialists. And while some newsrooms took it very seriously, it was kind of a silo. And um, I think this is a year where uh, we're full on aware of how environmental reporting has become much more central to everything we care about in journalism uh, and everything we have to cover, our politics, um, our public health, the future of our economy. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those subjects uh, like we've been reminded this year about uh, reporting on race in America. You know, a colleague of mine says, if you can't cover race in America, you can't cover anything because it's central to so many of the daily stories and the, the subjects of accountability, public power, private power that animate us uh, in journalism. And, and I think that is now true of environmental reporting as well. If you can't cover the environment, if you can't understand the intersections between um, the crises, interlocking crises in our environment, um, then you can't really, cover inequality, you can't cover racial justice, you can't cover elections, um, you can't cover budgets. And uh, I hope that one of the roles that the John B. Oaks Award has played in this journey is to continue not only to emphasize the centrality of environmental reporting in our, in our field, but also to model excellence as um, editors and producers you know, come to terms with how central these subjects are to, to any journalism plan these days. Uh, if you're mapping out coverage for a couple of weeks of a campaign or you're thinking about a year of investigative reporting, um, these are the subjects that, um, that we are duty bound and also that our readers and viewers increasingly demand that we cover in depth and with real fierceness and independence and that's what I think the award winners tonight, um, you know, bring to us uh, a long-standing commitment, but also some very timely and recent work that um, that models this kind of excellence. You know, I think one of the consequences of of this evolution in environmental reporting is that it's become more interdisciplinary, and we see that also in the way the work um, that we honor is evolving. You see more collaborations between journalists and, and scientists and academic researchers. You see uh, more use of uh, huge data sets to clarify um, changes and, and then journalists going into the field and practicing um, you know, the old uh, arts of uh, storytelling and uh, finding sources on the ground that the data may, may not um, reveal. And uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about tonight's conversation and the work uh, that we're going to honor for all those reasons. Um, 
Here's a short video that's going to come up uh, to describe the, the winner um, of the 2020 Oaks Award, as well as the two outstanding finalists. Um, the Oregonian uh, reporting that it highlights our winner um, reports on unchecked corporate giving and its impact on environmental policy in Oregon, one of the greenest states in the country. And our two finalists from the Los Angeles Times, uh, work that was uh, partially done with support from our postgraduate uh, journalism fellowship, which uh, Suzanne Rust uh, effectively created a few years ago, uh, demonstrating how climate change and rising sea levels are threatening uh, an American nuclear test site in the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. And then finally from the Washington Post, which we'll see first in this video, a series that analyzed global data sets and tracked nearly 170 years of temperature records to show that extreme climate change is already occurring across 10% of the Earth's surface, including in the United States. So let's take a look at the work we're honoring this year with the Oaks Awards. They're focusing on the places that have already seen temperatures rise by two degrees Celsius, or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the threshold that scientists say is where the effects of climate change become catastrophic and irreversible. And the first place the team focused on was right here in the U.S. What we found is that overall, there's three states that are big, fast warming leaders. Alaska, that will surprise nobody because it's partially in the Arctic. But also uh, New Jersey and Rhode Island are third and second, respectively. <laughs> And that signals that there's something going on with New England, because sure enough, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Maine are also well above um, 1 and, and actually above 1.5. So this region is interesting. It's not the only interesting region, but it's definitely in a region above average where there are also a lot of people. Between 1946 and 1958, the United States detonated 67 nuclear bombs in the Marshall Islands' northern atolls of Bikini and Anahuaytac. At first glance, the Marshall Islands appear peaceful, ecologically healthy, and isolated paradise, where skies are blue, where corals had been able to thrive, where turtles, sharks, fish are all in abundance. But more than any other place, the Marshall Islands is a victim of the two greatest threats facing humanity, nuclear weapons and climate change. The convergence is most symbolically epitomized at the tomb, an unlined bomb crater on the island of Runet in Enoetak Atoll. This is where the United States buried plutonium and other remnants of nuclear testing under an 18-inch thick concrete cap 39 years ago. As sea levels creep higher in the central Pacific, the tomb has begun bobbing up and down with the tides. The United States has no plan to prevent it from crumbling and spreading radiation even further across the nation's northern atolls. In the past few years in Salem, corporations have successfully lobbied lawmakers to kill, weaken, or stall efforts to clean up the air, fight climate change, protect threatened animals, prepare for oil spills, and restrict chemical aerial spraying. Why? It comes down to money. Politicians want it, and corporations want favors. In 1975, Oregon let go of all limits on campaign donations, and since then, contributions have skyrocketed. Except in 1996, when voters briefly revived contribution limits, which courts quickly struck down. Today, it's one of just five states without any restrictions. While Oregon is only the 27th largest state by population, it's number one per capita when it comes to corporate cash. And per lawmaker, Oregon is one of the highest ranking states for contributions from industries with a big stake in environmental laws. They're hoping to influence policy, and it's working. There is an expectation that I gave you $20,000 for your campaign. When we sit down in your office, we hope that your support will, will be there with us. The John B. Oaks Awards were established in 1993 to honor reporting that makes an exceptional contribution to the public's understanding of environmental issues. And they honor the memory of John Bertram Oaks, who was an uh, editorial writer and editor 
at the New York Times and was also a pioneer in environmental journalism. Um, these extraordinary examples of what uh, the Oaks Awards were established to honor, I think are gonna be shared with you in the chat links to them. And I, I'd encourage you uh, to read them um, if you haven't already. And I'd also like to welcome uh, the judges and the Oaks board members who are with us tonight. Uh, all of you involved in prizes and judging know that uh, it's an extraordinary amount of time and responsibility required to make an institution like this work from year to year. And I'm just very grateful to all of those who gave us their time and expertise uh, this year. And I'd also like to welcome and thank the members of the Oaks family who have joined us uh, this evening. Uh, so let me introduce this year's award winners. Uh, first, uh, Rob Davis, who's a reporter covering the environment uh, on the investigations team at the Oregonian in Portland. Uh, previously, he was a senior reporter and assistant editor at the Voice of San Diego, uh, the pioneering nonprofit news site. Uh, congratulations, Rob, and, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Suzanne Rust is an investigative reporter specializing in environmental issues at the Los Angeles Times. She and her team are finalists for their series, American Fallout, uh, beautiful photography and imagery you just saw. And the two finalist awards each carry a $1,500 prize. Before joining the LA Times, uh, Suzanne was the editor of our own environmental and uh, energy reporting project, where she oversaw several reporting projects, including a series that examined ExxonMobil's understanding of climate science uh, starting in the 1980s. So congratulations, Suzanne, and welcome back. Thank you for having me. I'm really honored. And uh, Chris Mooney writes about energy and environment at the Washington Post, a longtime leader in this field, uh, wrote a very good book that I remember reading a few years ago. And he and his team are finalists for the Oak Awards this year for their series, uh, Two Degrees Beyond the Limit, uh, which also happened to win um, another minor prize, the 2020 Pulitzer for Explanatory Journalism uh, earlier this year. So congratulations, Chris, and welcome. Thank you. Um, and finally, let me uh, welcome our moderator, Amelia Ascari. Amelia is a member of the Oaks Award jury and a prize-winning reporter with the Detroit, Detroit Free Press, where she covers public health and the environment. She has held numerous leadership roles in uh, professional journalism organizations, such as the Society of Environmental Journalists, which she helped to create. And she teaches an undergraduate class in environmental and public health journalism uh, through the University of Michigan's uh, program in the environment. So welcome, Amelia, and let me hand this over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so it is a great honor for me to uh, participate in this conversation with all of you this evening, uh, after, especially after having seen the very substantial competition for this award. Um, so my personal congratulations again to all the winners. Um, as uh, Dean Call mentioned, I do have a teaching experience and um, so I've been spending a lot of time on Zoom um, having conversations uh, of, of um, various natures. And uh, one of the uh, ideas that I, I'd like to share uh, before we get into our conversation, I'm going to ask you to put your questions in the chat and I will be reading the questions out. Um, and I'm also going to recommend uh, to keep everybody engaged uh, an activity uh, that's called a, a chat storm. Um, we are, our journalists are used to pulling out great quotes um, from conversations uh, and, and panels such as this one. And I'm going to ask you if you care to participate, that it would be terrific if you would uh, write down the, some of the quotes that you're hearing from some of these great journalists today, um, who um, the kinds of uh, observations that you might want to share. And then uh, at, at a moment when we, I'm done with uh, talking, and, and with the actual winners, and we're going to start taking questions from the audience. Maybe we'll have the chat storm where people can, at that moment, enter their uh, quotes in the chat so we can all see what were some of the highlights of the conversation for you from your perspective. Um, so let's uh, dive right in. I think that um, uh, 
uh, Dean Call really highlighted the importance of um, environmental journalism in, in, in the last few weeks as uh, stories of the tremendous fires in the Western United States have been dominating news. Uh, and so although we're going to spend most of our time talking about the prize winning stories that were published last year, I think it's appropriate and interesting to begin now by asking our prize winners uh, to share any observations they might have from covering the fires or about the stories on, uh, on the, the fires on the West Coast and connecting them with climate change. Um, so. Uh, I, I know that Suzanne has had uh, a lot of stories on the, um, this topic, on the, on the fires uh, in the LA Times in recent days. Uh, Suzanne, can you share with us some observations about uh, covering the, the fires and how that might connect with the earlier stories that you've done over the years related to climate change? Oh, I mean, I guess you know the the story I did for the Oaks Award that was that became a finalist was one of these stories that sort of is like the wildfires right now, where that just sort of inescapable of um, climate change sort of being there on us in the moment. I uh, I live in the Bay Area, I live right outside of San Francisco, and for three to four weeks there, I couldn't leave my house without being immersed in smoke. Uh, we had dreadful heat waves, two of them. Uh, we had all of the smoke everywhere from the fires. The fires were up all the way into Canada, all the way down to Mexico. Um, and it was one of those surreal moments where you sat there thinking, how can climate change not be visceral to everybody right now? Um, and so it's, it's uh, as, as Dean Call was saying earlier, it's one of those times where uh, the environment is no longer this sort of siloed uh, beat in the newsroom. It was it was front and center. There was there was no way to escape it. Thank you, um, Chris. Uh, your uh, package in the uh, in in the Washington Post was uh, all about the. Um, the changes that the world can expect to see related to climate change. Um, how do you um, um, connect or make interpret the reporting that's been going on uh, about the fires in relationship to the much bigger story? Why is it so difficult um, to draw those connections for uh, people who are consuming the news or do you think that many people are finally making those connections? I, I think the connection is getting across in this event and let, let me just say uh, it's, it's good to be here and I want to thank uh, Columbia Journalism School and the Oaks Award judges for recognizing our, our 2C series. Uh, when it comes to the fires, as someone who's been writing about climate change for a really long time, um, you, you you write over and over these stories about um, a particular event or series of related events and how much they are, um, quote, caused by climate change. And it's always the wrong question. The answer is never yes when you frame it that way. It's always um, more like climate change is contributing to this, climate change is upping the odds of events like this. There's always other factors and that's that's true here. Um, but what you have, uh, you have, basically little, little doubt at all uh, that climate change is making the West hotter and um, equally important, making it drier. Uh, and so no wonder you have uh, changes to fires. People are surprised at how fast um, the changes of large magnitude have occurred, but they make, they make perfect sense. And not only are the fires burning large areas, but they're just different beasts they show alarming new forms of behavior, they move faster, they're more explosive, and the firefighters themselves are uh, sort of providing the best testimony um, when it comes to the fact that they're encountering something that's outside of uh, historical memory. So I actually, I view the, the fires as a relatively simple case um, in terms of a climate role in a series of events. Uh, and I do think that, um, that this case has come across pretty clearly um, in a lot of coverage. Rob, you are uh, from Portland uh, and um, 
I, I know that your family has faced some uh, challenges related to the fires and uh, so has your newsroom. Uh, can you share some of your observations on um, the challenges of covering the fires and also connecting uh, that story to climate change? Yeah, I, and I, I want to um, thank you for the question, and I want to thank the, the judges and uh, the Oaks family and the Columbia Journalism School for the award. I'm deeply honored. Um, you know, it, it has been a hellacious year for our newsroom. Um, you know, we started out with the pandemic into um, never ending protests and clouds of tear gas. Um, and then the clouds of tear gas relented and they were followed by wildfire smoke that was the thickest it has ever been in Portland. Um, and so, you know, looking at sort of the, the landscape there where, you know, Portland suburbs are not accustomed to being evacuated um, from uh, wildfire risk. And, you know, it, it is knocking on the door of one of America's largest cities in a way, you know, an issue of climate change is in a way that it hasn't before. Um, and so, you know, I think for a lot of people there, it's deeply concerning, um, you know, and what it means to breathe air that uh, is being measured, um, you know, that's off the charts. It's beyond hazardous. Um, and, you know, if we're early in the game here, what is it going to mean in a year or five years or 10 years? Um, and so I think that that sort of fuels the uncertainty and fuels the concern that, that, um, that folks are facing there. Okay. Um, certainly it is a concerning situation and, um, um, and, uh, it's it's um, it's heartening to see the um, the journalists and the other people, of course, as first responders, putting themselves in the way of these fires to get the stories. Um, so, Rob, uh, taking a, a look now at your prize-winning story series, polluted by money. Um, we had a um, opportunity for people who were registered to attend this Zoom to um, offer some questions in advance. And we had a great question from David Sassoon, the editor of Inside Climate News, about your series. So I thought we'd kick it off with that. Um, David asks, how did the idea for Polluted by Money originate and get developed? And how did it change as you pursued it? Um just covering the environment in Oregon, I was listening, you know, for, for the last seven years, I've been listening to people talk about Oregon being an environmental leader. And, and they were pointing to examples of initiatives that passed in the late 1960s or early 1970s before most Oregonians were alive or living in the state. Um, and, and at the same time, I was writing about issue after issue and it would go to the legislature and um, you know, the, the movement of crude oil by rail um, that came out of nowhere in late 2012. Um, the you know, minor safety tweaks went to the legislature and California and Washington's legislatures um, approved bills and Oregon's stalled. Uh, then a train crashed in the Columbia River Gorge, one of the most scenic locations in the Pacific Northwest, sent oil into the Columbia River during peak salmon migration. And then people told me, this is going to be the year that we pass something. And then again, it stalled. Um, and so on issue after issue, um, you know, with the environment, you know, seemingly progressive Oregon was taking a back seat to long, you know, what legislatures in California and Washington were doing. At the same time, those same lawmakers were touting the state's environmental credentials. And it was, it was that lack of harmony that just didn't ring true to me. Um, and I really wanted to explore why, why was it this way? What was it about Oregon that was, um, you know, had this kind of corrosive influence 
Um, and it didn't take long uh, when my colleague Steve Suo and I began looking at campaign finance um, donations, comparing the donation to sitting politicians in Oregon to those in legislatures across the state, uh, across the nation. And, um, you know, they were, they were shocking. Um, and, and you see just a flood of corporate money into Oregon's political system. And, uh, you know, the effects are impossible to ignore. And it affects a huge suite of policies, um, but in in Oregon, where you know people so treasure open spaces and clean air and clean water, um, you know there were there were few issues that that seemed um, out of step more than the lawmakers' treatment of of the environment. Well, it certainly is impressive work. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and uh, uh, we we understand that, of course, there's been change prompted by your um, your series, and um, wondering if you could uh, share a little bit about um, um, how that came to be, and also um, adding in a question from Jeff Burnside. Um, what did the industry lobbyists and lawyers do to try to slow or block um, this kind of uh, reporting that you were doing and the changes that the legislature eventually enacted? Yeah, I mean, industry lobbyists have, have I think, primarily been focused on pushing through, um, you know, policies that are continued to be friendly to them. Um, you know, as, as I was reporting the series, I was listening to Democratic lawmakers and I'm telling them about, you know, our findings and, and, and folks said, well, but we are working on making Oregon the second state in the nation to adopt a cap and trade policy. And uh, that went down um, in, in a, a major defeat for the governor and the Democratic supermajorities in the uh, state's House and Senate. Uh, in in 2019, uh, a few months after our our series ran, and um, the state supreme court has reversed an earlier decision that um, would allow Oregon voters to um, adopt campaign donation limits. It is one of five states without them. Um, and voters uh, will also be asked in November whether they want to amend the state's constitution to um, expressly permit limits on campaign uh, donations, uh, which have proved to be hugely popular um, with voters in Multnomah County, which is the, the county that is the home to Portland, and in the city of Portland, um, where something like 90% of voters have approved limits. Um, and so there has been, there has been movement. Um, you know, this last year, the legislature began moving on some bills like safety, uh, safety improvements for oil by rail um, that had been stalled for a long time. Um, but on climate, Oregon uh, continues to sort of twiddle its thumbs. So I think that uh, one of the takeaways for me from um, this conversation and from reading some of the materials that you submitted uh, as part of your, your application for this award was the power of uh, journalists, you as an individual, just asking the tough questions and uh, putting together the bigger picture that um, maybe was unknown to many, many people in, in Oregon, um, that uh, the inside players knew that all of this money was flowing in at a much higher rate than in other states. But until you ask those questions and um, pull together the classic follow the money kind of story, this uh, wasn't, um, it's, it wasn't visible to the people of Oregon now that they know there's a lot of conversation uh, about trying to fix that situation. So, so kudos to you on that. 
Um, so uh, now I guess, Chris, I'd like to turn to your story in the Washington Post. Um, and uh, it was a different kind of story. It was also um, very data-driven. In fact, the most data-driven story perhaps I've ever seen. Um, I just want to read one line from uh, the application letter that your editor sent. Um, it says that your, your reporters at the Post, we located every official land and ocean temperature report going back to 1662 including not only today's satellites, but also a ship log entry by <laughs> Admiral William Bly, rep recording temperatures days before his men mutinied. Um, so how did you find that, all of that information? How did you possibly put it together and make sense of it? What a challenge. Um, well, the, 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 when we ran the, the temperature maps, we were mostly focusing on the last 100 20 years, 140 years, and so forth. But you know, for one of the pieces, we did go farther back and dip into uh, very early climate records, which are um, really quite important as well. And uh, that was just to show how we know uh, what the temperature of the world was long ago, which is, of course, crucial to knowing how much it's changed. Uh, and once you do that, once you dig into the archives, you realize that whether it's uh, Captain Bly or any number of other uh, scientists, amateurs, uh, something in between who were dutifully taking down records uh, hourly all over the world going back hundreds of years, you realize that the whole edifice of uh, what we now think of as, as the science of climate change is built on these billions of observations that all of these uh, people were independently taking. Uh, and so it's not, it's not a theory, it's not a computer model, it's actually a gigantic data project. Uh, and, and once we looked at it that way, we were able to see that there were things in the data that were really interesting uh, journalistically that scientists probably knew, but they weren't as something where they felt they had to rush out and, and publish on it. Um, in particular, we get uh, every year the news from NASA or NOAA or a uh, number of other groups, well, it was the second hottest year in the record, or it was the third, or now it's, you know, it's the first. And I'm sure we'll have the first again uh, pretty soon because the records keep getting broken. Um, that's all based on these measurements from around the globe. And that means that every, every location, um, you know, it also has its own record of change. And in some cases, the changes are much, much bigger uh, than the global average. So once we realized that, we realized, wow, if we can just map all of these places and, and how much they've deviated from their baseline, we are going to find a lot of interesting stories. And in fact, that's how it turned out. So that was the project. You know, one of the things about your story that I, I think um, it really highlights another important um, role of journalism is um, sometimes taking the big picture look and asking these questions that the scientists should have been asking. They should have been uh, using this data in the same way. There's so many times that, uh, especially government, will uh, create all kinds of data, inspection reports, uh, temperature readings, various other things. Um, and, uh, and then, um, People get so caught up in um, just collecting it and uh, meeting some kind of regulatory requirement to have the data that sometimes the big picture is a little bit hard to interpret for the public and, and move toward, uh, toward some kind of uh, greater understanding. So why do you think it is that um, it took a team of journalists from the Washington Post to uh, take this big picture look and, and create this, this algorithm that was able to make these fantastic maps that show, allow people to see how temperatures in their regions are expected to change. Oh, I think it's, well, we have, you know, we're complementary uh, as journalists and, and the scientists, but we do have different objectives sometimes. And so, you know, us uh, pushing our data abilities pretty far is still, um, uh, basically not that impressive to them and they're off doing something super more complicated than that. So I think it falls in, in a bit of a gap. 
Uh, but what we did find is once we did our uh, analysis, uh, it was almost always the case that when we found a hot spot, a place where climate change was above average somewhere in the world, then once we'd found it, we went and looked at what science already had to say about it. And there were always, you know, little known studies in the scientific journals about this place and what was happening there. Like there, somebody was onto it. Um, but in, in many cases, it had not gotten any, any media attention uh, at all. So, um, so that was really interesting. Um, there, was, there was always some, some researcher who in their part of the world had noticed uh, the changes going on. Uh, we just had to find them. And the data pointed us to them. Right, and, uh, and so it's important to have this kind of objective of communicating to the public, which is the, the journalist's role and not always the scientist's role, right? Uh, so it's an interesting uh, cultural difference and, um, and uh, you know, purpose, professional purpose. Um, so both are needed, absolutely. Great work. Um, Suzanne, turning to your story now, and Carolyn, if she's there with you, um, your colleague. Uh, I, I was um, struck not only by the, um, the, the stunning pictures from, from the Marshall Islands uh, and, and, and story you told there, um, but the, also the, um, the description of how difficult it was to get there and get this information and how, uh, just as uh, Chris was saying, how very few people how that information was known to the local people, but it, even though the United States created uh, a lot of the um, um, the hazard in that situation there, um, it was so uh, uh, unknown um, to, to uh, people in the United States. Uh, your, in your nomination letter, your editors said that you swam in reefs cratered by bombs and um, and reviewed thousands of historical and scientific documents, medical records, photographs, and, and ultimately uh, uncovered unreported human rights and environmental atrocities connected to the bomb tests in the Marshall Islands. Uh, tell us more about that reporting process, which sounds um, very dangerous. Uh, well, I'm not sure the, uh, I, and I do, I have Carolyn Cole sitting here right next to me. We're both at an airport in Miami. So forgive us if uh, somebody, a um, microphone starts speaking over us. Um, yeah, the, the reporting was incredibly difficult. Uh, the Marshall Islands are 5,000 miles away. Um, it's a really, from, from our viewpoint, clearly not from the Marshallese point of view, a very remote area. Uh, it takes two days to get there. Um, and that's just to the to the main islands uh, of Majuro and Kwajalein, where the U.S. has a military base. But then to get to the northern atolls where the testing took place, you need to get on a boat, and that takes another two days. So it's not an easy place to get to. Um, there were tons of challenges with the reporting, largely because of because of the distance um, getting there. But it it was. Um, I came on to the story actually as a result of talking to researchers at Columbia University, who were looking at the radiation legacy on several of these islands. And as they were describing what they had discovered, I was stunned at how little I knew. Um, and I figured if I knew that little about what had happened here in the Marshall, Marshall Islands, most people didn't know. And it turned out as I talked to people about the story I was working on, I would say, well, you know, the Marshall Islands and people would say, what's that? And then I would say, well, you've heard bikini uh, as in the bathing suit, that's the island where uh, I believe it was 33 nuclear tests were conducted, were conducted, and away talk is where another 40, I'm getting the numbers wrong, but another 34 were conducted. Um, and so what I, what I went and discovered soon after that uh, was how very little uh, Americans do know about this. I went to visit a, um, a library in California uh, where they uh, have the textbooks that are approved for high school education in the state. Um, and look through all the history, American history and world history textbooks. There was no mention of what happened in the Marshall Islands. So um, yes, anyway, uh, to your question, uh, it was surprising how little I knew um, and discovered how little was taught about this period in time. Um, and also it was an incredibly uh, difficult to uh, report on it. 
but I wouldn't say dangerous. Um, it was, uh, well, I suppose it could be dangerous, but uh, the, in the water, uh, you're not at risk of being exposed to uh, radiation. Um, Carolyn and I may have spent too much time on some of the beaches with sand in our hands and therefore in our mouths, but um, I have two children who I think are watching and, and they're fine. I'm not planning on having any more, so I think I'm okay. That sounds good. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're okay. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, there's this old saying about uh, journalism that it's the first rough draft of history. And one of the things that I find really moving about your piece and your package is that it demonstrates that it, it can also be a re the revised draft of history. It can go back and try to set the record straight. Um, and I think that uh, in the last few months, as we've seen so many protests and increase in conversation about um, uh, voices and stories that will have not made it into the textbooks and not made it into our conversations. Um, it's, uh, and, and I would point out though, that this prize uh, was, uh, discussions happened before those protests. And yet I feel like uh, what a perfect fit that uh, your story is one of those that we're honoring today uh, because it uh, goes back and tries to um, write the wrong in the history books and help raise uh, the concern. And in fact, you've had an impact um, in, in funding for um, trying to address the kind of twin concerns of the nuclear waste and the, the rising um, um, tides of, uh, related to climate change. Um, so you wanna fill us in on, on some of that? Yeah, at the end of last year, Congress ordered uh, the Department of Energy to go and look at this dome that we've talked about that you probably heard about in the video, this area where there is nuclear waste piled under this concrete dome and where the rising sea levels are coming in and sweeping in, um, sort of moving the uh, radioactive um, waste that's in there, moving it in and out of this uh, particular atoll. Congress ordered the Department of Energy to go in and um, assess what the risk was to the people who live there, um, as well as to assess the risk that climate change poses uh, to the dome. Not surprisingly, the Department of Energy says there really is no concern there. Um, and the line they keep falling back on is that the atoll is so contaminated already that if any more nuclear waste were to come out of this dome into the atoll itself, uh, you wouldn't even notice because it's so bad in the atoll already. So, hmm. um, you know, I think I, I think to your point, uh, it just we need to keep reporting on these kinds of stories uh, to to make things happen. Right now, um, the Marshall Islands, uh, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, is in negotiations with the U.S. government. Um, to extend a compact that they have a free association, the two um, nations together. Um, and in, re in return for um, work visas here in the United States and um, funding for development, uh, education and healthcare in the Marshall Islands, um, the US has a, has a huge military base um, in the Marshall Islands. It's conveniently located in the middle of the Pacific. It's one of our um, strongholds against uh, uh, nations such as China or North Korea. It's sort of a first line of defense. And so as they're renegotiating this compact, um, because part of this reporting and also from others, um, the, uh, and, and largely because of the Marshallese, they've really been outspoken about this. Uh, they are, uh, they, they finally have some weight upon which to stand, sorry about that, um, to, to hopefully make changes. Uh, and how the U.S. government responds to this issue. Okay, so um, I'm gonna have one more question for your team, maybe to Carolyn, uh, since she's with you there, um, and also worked on this project, if she's interested uh, in responding. Um, and um, before I ask the question though, uh, I wanna give, the, uh, any Columbia students on this uh, uh, Zoom, uh, gathering here in the Zoom gathering, a heads up that um, we are here um, 
in the virtual space created by Columbia University. Uh, and it's, it's your house, the, the house that Pulitzer built, as uh, the t-shirt, my alumni t-shirt says. And uh, so I want to give a Columbia student, if we have any here, the chance to ask a question. And I'll be looking for that soon. Um, but right now, uh, here's a question for, um, for your team, Suzanne or Carolyn, um, from Jack Rossiter Munley, um, who asks, since above ground nuclear testing was widespread, widespread for so many years, are there other sites like the Marshall Islands that as they are impacted by climate change are at risk of releasing radioactive debris? Is that something you're looking into? Uh, I'll take that. There are other places. There's nothing of this size um, anywhere uh, that, that I know of. Um, there were uh, nuclear waste sites or testing sites in Siberia, for instance, in the Ukraine, um, at Johnston Atoll. So there are places where there is um, nuclear waste on the land from above ground testing. There was some in Nevada, as a matter of fact. But again, nothing to the extent uh, that was seen in, in the Marshall Islands. It is uh, really quite, quite, quite extraordinary what, what happened there. OK. Um... And I understand that Jack is a new uh, journalism school graduate uh, from Columbia. So uh, thanks for that good question, Jack. Do we have any other uh, Columbia students or for a recent graduates who want to ask a question right now? Yeah. Oh, Go oh. for it. So my name is Matilde Uta. I'm at the graduate school at Columbia. Um, so I have a question for Chris uh, Moni. Um, you know, what will be the next big project of mapping the developments of the change of our globe? Like, will it be rise of sea level? What it, will it be storms? Like, you know, because it's just, you just need to start working. Because I was even surprised that the rise of temperature could become a story like this, because I was like, yeah, we've all seen that map of NASA. Like, isn't that common knowledge? But obviously it isn't. <laughs> Good question. Thank you, you. You're right um, that there are are many things that you could map and uh, and you you know we just did temperature it's sort of the most basic way that climate change affects the world but there are so many others and you're also right that um, I mean I looked at this a little but I didn't get very far uh, sea level rise also varies around the globe um, and there are hot spots of, of sea level rise there's also actually places where sea level is falling because of complex gravitational effects that occur around large pieces of ice. Um, when they lose mass, the, the sea actually falls. So you'll see it falling around Greenland and around Alaska and places like that, um, revealing land rather than taking it away. Uh, you, you, can, you can do it with um, you can do it with fires, you could do it with storms. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of, lot of mapping uh, that, could be, that could be done, so yeah. Okay. Um, while uh, we have Chris here, uh, I do have a question for you. Um, and uh, before I ask that, I want to invite anybody who has uh, gathered quotes for our chat storm. Let's try that now. Time to storm the chat with some good quotes from these great journalists. And, uh, and while that uh, may or may not be happening, Chris, here's your question. Uh, when you hear President Trump assuring officials in California that it will get colder after all the data collecting analysis of your stories, what more can be said to convince the so-called climate skeptics? Uh, I mean, all I can say is that we keep breaking temperature records on a regular basis. Um, the trend is up, it's been up for a long time. It is hard to see what would make it go down in the, in, in, if you just look at the, the way the system works. Uh, it's, it's really, the interesting question is not, is it rising or will it stop anytime soon? I think that, I think that those are sort of closed. Um, the interesting one is what is, what is the rate uh, and will it increase even more? I mean, I, you know, we, we talked about places that have individually crossed two degrees Celsius threshold. Um, but, you know, sooner or later, maybe in a decade, um, I don't know, but it's going to be very interesting to watch. You're going to have the whole globe cross um, for at least one year, the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. Um, I'm not, I have no way of predicting when, but I, it might be, it might be fairly soon for at least one anomalous hot year 
that will then be the record, but it, you know, if, if things continue, it won't be the record um, for all that long. Uh, so every, every decade is, is hotter than the last, going back many decades. And um, if you don't change the fundamental driver, then that would, there's no reason that that would, that would stop. Okay, so I have uh, one uh, more question from the audience for Rob. And then after that, I'm going to do a lightning round, a closing lightning round uh, with all of our um, winners. So the question for Rob uh, is, what role or influence does the timber in industry have in Oregon? And what impacts might that have had on this year's fires? Good question. Um, the timber industry is a major employer still. It's not the behemoth it once was in Oregon, but it's still an important um, <clears throat> economic source for rural, rural Oregonians. Um, it has held on to a lot of power uh, in Oregon. It, uh, the, the industry um, gives more in sheer dollars and per capita in Oregon than in any other state in the nation. Um, and the result of that is that logging in Oregon is done with far fewer protections than it is um, in Washington or California in, in somewhat similar forest types. Um, they're cutting closer to, um, closer to protected streams um, than in the other states. Um, they, they, they take more off of the landscape and they pay far fewer um, dollars in taxes uh, than they do in the other states. Um, the the concern going forward uh, and the issue going forward is what uh, more frequent or what a climate change affected fire regime is going to mean um, in the um, Western Oregon landscapes where the timber industry is a major landholder. Um, when they cut uh, they replant, but they are planting monoculture stands that scientists have found are um, more likely to burn uh, more intensely than in um, the federal forests that are turning into old growth next door. Um, and so, you know, that that's that's the the issue um, going forward with the with the industry as it relates to fire. All right. Um, so my final question, lightning round for all of our winners is um, this. We're, I think we're living in a time when simultaneously more people than ever before are turning to news uh, sites and, and for critical information that they need to make decisions around our democracy. And yet, simultaneously more people than ever before are very critical of journalism and, um, and, and um, the work that journalists do. So I think people don't really understand what journalists do, the obstacles that journalists face, um, and also what motivates journalists, um, like the people on this panel. So my question is, what inspires you to keep doing this kind of work that you do? And what would you most like the public to understand about environmental journalism? So who wants to take that one? I'll, I'll shag it. I mean, the other winners um, and their really incredible work um, are what inspire me. Um, and you know the the response that i got to this series from our readers was beyond anything i ever expected um i've been a journalist for 20 years and never heard from more people outraged um at something i've written um and and so that was was heartening um don't ask me whether i'm optimistic about things um but it it um it, it was, that was, that was inspiring, the, the role that a local newspaper can play in informing the citizenry. I agree. Who's next? I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so with this project, 
I would, I was inspired. Um, and what inspired me was realizing, uh, that when, uh, journalists at an institution put their brains together and we, we are fortunate that we're able to use a lot of brains. Um, we ultimately tallied up 53 people that worked on this project in some way. Um, and many people traveled all over the globe for stories. Uh, we can find ways to, uh, to do real analysis, use data and answer questions that haven't really been answered before. And that, that was really exciting to me. Um, I, I don't think it was until uh, the last five years or so that I really realized that um, the potential for that, that kind of journalism. Uh, so I, I, I was thrilled, uh, I was motivated, I, <laughs> I was excited, um, work all throughout working on the project. Uh, so. Fantastic, agree. And uh, I'll jump in here, I'm sorry again about the uh, background noise. Um, I, I'm with Rob, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly inspired by my fellow journalists, you know, particularly those on this panel, uh, the journalists I've met on the Oaks board in the past, uh, I'm, the, the reading I do. Um, and I would also say I'm, I'm just constantly inspired by people's stories. I mean, the, the Marshall Islands was a you know, story that was told to me and the, and the injustice that happened there. And um, I, I, I think, again, sort of to, to speak about the time we're living in, um, really that idea of, their, of, of injustice is what, is what gets me going every day. And then asking questions about why is it like it is? Why, why is this um, that that's what sort of gets my blood pumping every day and trying to find that out and have try to find answers for people. All right. Well, I want to say that I uh, also uh, feel like this was a, such an inspiring, inspiring hour for all of us who were able to listen. Um, and uh, I think, I hope that we brought some, not only some, honor and uh, explanation to, 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 to the, the journalists who are working on these really great stories, but also that we have helped um, potentially somebody who will listen to this now or in the future uh, to understand this work that is really critical and uh, never more critical. It feels like we are in a most historic moment so I want to um, send every journalist who is hearing this um, a message of thanks uh, and support uh, for the very critical and important work you do. And uh, Dean Call reminded me just moments before this uh, conversation was open to the public that we usually at the end of this um, uh, meeting, um, uh, ceremony of honoring the Oaks winners, uh, Dean Call usually invites people to the bar at the back of the room. So we can't do that, but I invite you all virtually to raise a glass of whatever um, you might uh, feel like uh, drinking tonight uh, to these great journalists and the wonderful stories that they put together to the organizations, the news organizations behind them that funded this, however difficult that might have been from all sides. Um, and to the, and I hope that, um, I hope that you continue to do great work. I hope that you can find something in the uh, airport lounge there <laughs> where you're waiting to take off for your next story, Suzanne, that will help you um, on your flight. And, um, and that's it, good evening and thank you to everyone.